before we get started, I would still like to introduce a man that from a young age has been in graphic art seeking work in drawing comics, which led to writing, toy designing, and entrepreneurship, and is working with Spawn. You know who I'm talking about? Ladies and gentlemen, Todd McFarlane. Test, test. This is my mic? Okay, before we get going, we're gonna do a selfie with all of you guys. Screw Bradley Cooper. We're gonna do better than that. So he said, Todd, go warm him up. So he's gonna he's gonna make it here. He moves a little bit slow. So I'll just tell you some silly stories, do some goofy stuff, and then when Stan gets here, we'll hand it over to the guy and I'll I'll do an interview with him. Let me let me just tell you my introduction to Stan Lee. I'm I'm 16 years old. I started collecting at about 15, 16, uh, and so I become a fanatic. I start collecting everything that's on the marketplace. I'm also an athlete. I played Pac-10 baseball, right? I wanted to be center field for somebody and I just wasn't good enough. But I ended up going down to Florida on a baseball uh, tryout, tournament, whatever, and we did our baseball stuff and then we, we had to go to the hotel and we had to catch a plane back, I'm Canadian, back, back up to Canada that night. And we go back to the hotel and all of a sudden, and for some of you older people out there, they used to... <laughs> It's, which is surprising when I look here. They used to hold these conventions in hotels, small little holiday inns, right? And they put up a little sign saying come convention down in that room. So I was, it's true, some of you old folks, right? They used to be small. So I'm at this holiday inn and I'm walking and all of a sudden I see the sign that says comic convention. And I go, wow, what's the chances on my last day here in Florida I get to go to convention, a comic book convention, the first one I ever went to. And they don't have a lot up in Canada at that point. I go in there, I meet a bunch of people, and then one of the booths that was table, maybe it was about half the side, that was sitting just outside, there's a guy there, Stan Lee. First time I met him. I'm 16 years old at that point. I, I stand off to the side for about an hour, and I just listen to him with his enthusiasm, and then, like any geeky fan, I basically ask the question that all of you guys would have asked. Is it okay if I sit here for the rest of the day next to you? And he went, yeah, sure, I don't care. So literally, literally, ladies and gentlemen, he was here, his line was coming, and I was here. People kept asking who I was, and he's like, I don't know. And for the whole day, I sat there as a 16-year-old just listening to all the questions that he got peppered with and all the answers he gave. And as a guy that was, in a couple years, going to start sending out my samples, I learned more in those two or three hours that I just sat by his side. And I, and I remember some of the answers. I actually started applying some of those answers onto my artwork so that, fast forward, I start sending off my samples with some of those answers that I'd heard in my head as a 16-year-old. I get a job, fast forward a little bit more, I'm doing Spider-Man, fast forward a little bit more, I get to meet Stan, and we've been fast friends ever since, which is why a lot of times he asked me to get up on stage here and help with the conversation because he is very good, ladies and gentlemen, at making me understand that I am the Robin in the Batman and Robin partnership that you will soon see. He will always flex the symbol, and he'll, you'll see it a couple times here. Uh, I'm going to give his secret away because he's going he's gonna to come here and he's going to... He, he, he likes to make you guys feel good. He likes to make himself feel good. And then he didn't really care much about me, and so we'll have a little, we'll have a little bit of fun uh, with that. Uh, Stan also, uh, it was this interesting thing that we used to talk about when I was at my heyday doing Spider-Man, that we were talking about the movie coming up, and, and now we're going to go back, for all you people who have obviously seen, oh, let, let's, instead of raising your hand who's seen the Spider-Man movie, let's ask the opposite. Who in this room has not seen a Spider-Man movie? Well, Helen Keller on the back there, I see her. <laughs> All right, so so everybody see one. So what was happening was, and I'm going back now, 25 years now maybe. I don't know if you guys know, but the, the franchise was in legal turmoil. What had happened was somebody owned the rights, 
and then about six other companies said that they owned the rights, and it was just a headache. And, and, and they couldn't get a Spider-Man movie off the ground for about a decade, right? For about a decade, they were fighting globally, six companies globally, because just when they tied all the rights up in the U.S., somebody then on the other side of the world said, no, 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 I have the rights to Spider-Man. You can't make that movie. And, and the only reason I bring that up, it is one of the few times, as a matter of fact, maybe the only time, that I can say thank you to the lawyers. Because if they had made, no, 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 and here's why I say that. Because if they had made that movie back then, the technology wasn't there. It would have been nearly as cool back then. Because they, they, can't, they can't do, and that would have been like 88 to 92 era. They, they couldn't have made the movies that they made today. So that they fought legally for 15 years and dragged it into the years 2000 and, and, and more, that movie now can look cool. So for the lawyers out there, thank you, because it's going to be the only time I'm going to thank you for getting into a big argument because it made the Spider-Man movie much better. Now, for me and my, and my Spider-Man uh, days, here's how it sort of went, ladies and gentlemen. I got the job of, of Spider-Man. Spider-Man, and it may seem sort of odd, was not even a top 10 selling book at that point at Marvel. They were, the sales had been plummeting. And they came in and it was a good time to be there, right? If, uh, I, I'm going to give you guys a word of advice. If you're ever going to take over a job, make sure you take over the job of the guy who just did a horrible version of it, right? <laughs> you look good. You look good. Never follow Jim Lee or Frank Miller or any of those guys. Never follow the big shots, right? Always follow the small shots because you always look better. I, I always say, you want to look smart, hang around dumb people or five-year-olds, right? You always look like a genius. You hang around five-year-olds, you go with four times four, 16. Come on, come on, come on. So I was on a book, and, the, and the, the luck that I had was that they said, the book is not selling, do something. So I, it, it, this is weird. If I had actually come on the book at a time that the book was selling, they wouldn't have said that. They would have basically said, just keep doing what was successful, the guys before you. And so they came there, and they said, do whatever you want to do. I had the fortune to be able to do it for a couple years. And I was able to make a decent career. And with that, let's talk about the man who actually co-created Spider-Man. There's nobody in this room who has not been touched by the gentleman I'm going to bring up here real quick. So we won't belabor the point. He is, ladies and gentlemen, truly, he's a living legend. There, you can't say that about too many people. This man is a living legend. Everybody in this room is here for a reason. Because somewhere along the line, this man's creation has touched your life. And there's not a creative person that's in that room down below who he ha also had them touch. He's created, co-created Iron Man, Thor, Fantastic Four, a bunch of the guys in the Avengers, Spidey. I mean, I'm going to miss the Hulk. I'm going to miss them all, right? So we're going to bring them out. But to you guys out there, especially the young kids, he's that old dude that's in all those Spider or those superhero <laughs> movies, Mr. Stanley. <laughs> something nice about somebody, just be quiet. <laughs> I thought I'd let you listen to McFarlane for a while, because then you'll appreciate me when I come on. <laughs> hey, forgive me, I know it must have been an ordeal for you, but at least now we're on the right track. Why are you there and I'm here? No, I'm just, Why aren't we together? I'm moving, I'm moving this back so these people don't have to look at the corner of the table here. Come sit down, we'll have a chat. Are you we'll be sit like, there? We'll be like between Why can't two I ferns. Sit at the table? Between two ferns, Obama. Sit down. So. I need the protection of a table in front of me. Oh, you, you We're too vulnerable this way. <laughs> all right, what the hell? Okay. So let's ask the first obvious question that they're all begging to ask you right now, Sam. What's it like being you? It's wonderful. I I can't describe it. The glory, the grandeur. <laughs> What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> hey, hey, I don't know if you guys know, Stan was in San Francisco yesterday, throwing out the first pitch at uh, the, the Giants' ball game. Oh, the San Francisco Giants! Right. 
to uh, actor Michael Rooker from Walking Dead, who's down here. And, and Michael had been sitting down in the green room uh, making excuses why he couldn't catch Stan's fastball. So I begged Michael to be here instead of what's his name, but Michael obviously had more important things to do. I got stuck with. I'll remember your name sooner or later. What is it you do again? Uh, I just copy some of the crap you did. This guy, <laughs> this guy did the best-selling Spider-Man book of all time. Years ago. And I was so jealous I didn't talk to him for five years. <laughs> all right. So look at everybody, whether you're old or you're young, at some point you got to go out into the world trying to get a job, right? I mean, arguably one of the most difficult things we have to do. I've written before how I got rejected hundreds of times. So see if you can just tell people how you got your introduction into the business and how tough of a road it was and how many doors you got closed on your face before they finally well, said. It was easy for me. I started out as a lowly assistant. People realized how brilliant I was, and before you knew it, I was the editor and art director. See, see he's got to learn how to cut a story short. I heard it before going on and on and on with his history, and I heard the sound of snoring in the audience, and I said, I've got to come up here and rescue you, because I care for you people. Yes. And by the way, let me take the pain and the injury out of what I just said. Let me say something nice. I have something for you that you don't expect. Now this is gonna be a very touching moment. You're in for a real event that you're gonna see right now. Nobody ever gives this man anything because nobody likes him, but I have something for you. And um, Mac, no, not Mac, Max. I forgot his name. Max, would you please bring the something out? Stand up. Uh -oh. Oh. Take the mic. Look what I've got for him. A Spider-Man guitar. <laughs> Signed by Stan Lee. He is so awed, he is so overwhelmed by gratitude. What's he doing? Aren't you gonna play it for us? All right. Well, I thought it would really cause more of a stir than that. I mean, if that's how emotional you're gonna get, I'm gonna take the damn thing back. All right, let's go back uh, to the early 60s. I mean, that's it with the guitar. We, we planned it, we rehearsed it for hours, that, that we'd give him the guitar and he would melt in, in a sea of emotion and gratitude. Oh, boy. Uh, you can this see is why I have no use for the man. Yeah. I've been telling you. You can see he's a writer. He likes to embellish, ladies and gentlemen. So, let's go, let's go back to the 60s now. 60s, there's, again, for, uh, I don't know how old and how much people read history, Comic books sort of are in their zenith in the 30s and the 40s. And then in the 50s, we get in trouble with comic books, right? We have the Congress has their hearings. Dr. Wortham comes in, says the comic books are distorting the See, mind. He says to be right, but he doesn't wait for an answer. He keeps going on and on. You let this man have a stage. You give him a microphone. I could leave and have lunch. And he'll still be, he wouldn't know I was gone. Go ahead. <laughs> To rescue them for you, and I still can't shut them up. I mean, to rescue them from you. Okay. So let's see if we can answer at least one question before these good people have to go here. So in the 60s, and they this don't have to go, they're going because you won't stop talking. <laughs> I know, I am adorable. <laughs> Let's see if we can get one question answer. In the 60s, no, but again, they have the Congress. It's your question. They're supposed to answer. No, no, we're going to get to them. Oh, really? We're going to get to them. We're going to get to your questions in a bit. But, I, but here's, here's the, the thing. I mean, look, they all know you from your Marvel work. And for all intents and purposes, it's, it's the 60s. The 60s character. So, so, so talk to us about Congress coming out. 
having all the, the, the literally having to reinvent Marvel. How did you guys go about reinvent Marvel and ultimately you creating all those characters? I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Congress wanted to do something and I had to reinvent Marvel. No, 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 you're right. So Marvel comes along, right? So Marvel, because you were talking well, let me tell you something about Marvel, reinventing it. I mean, you've gotten used to his dull stories. Now I'll tell you a good one. We changed our name to Marvel when our superheroes started selling well. We were called Atlas Comics. And when we had the Fantastic Four and then the X-Men and Spider-Man and so forth, I said, I'm gonna change the name of the company and give it some excitement. So I called it Marvel, because I love advertising. And with a name like Marvel, they could come up with phrases like, make my Marvel. Welcome to the Marvel Age of Comics, you know, stuff like that. Now, our competition was then called National Comics. They always followed whatever I did. So, they said in their brilliance, Hey, Stan Lee changed the name of his company, let's change our name. Now, here's the part that's going to get you. We came up with the name Marvel, which is so great to use in ads and so forth. What did they come up with? D.C. <laughs> Welcome to the D.C. age of comics. Make mine D.C. I mean, it was so easy for us to do better than them all those years. And don't get me wrong, I love D.C. All right, now tell one of your dull stories. So, so now you've got Marvel, and now you've got to come up with uh, basically a band of new characters. So walk us through the process of what it was like, because it seemed like you were throwing out a lot of ideas to those creative guys, the artists at that point, that were having to take all your crazy ideas. And I mean, within the span, all those characters I just mentioned earlier came out in a span of about three years. So why, why was that so prolific at that point? Well, he started to say, what was it like? And I'll show you why I'm such a good guest up on a platform like this. It was nice. <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. You know, when you're a genius, you can't explain where you are. I'm going to tell you, well, you started to look like Albert Einstein too, right? <laughs> so, the funny thing is, here I am bragging. This man did our best-selling comic. He's a writer, he's an artist, he has a zillion dollar toy business, he makes toys. He is so goddamn successful that I hate him. And that's why I'm talking, I'm so jealous of him. But aside from that, I like him, if I can only remember his name. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, 91. 91 years old! Everybody thinks I'm only 89. <laughs> a youthful 89. Hey, look, look, when, when I was younger going to conventions, I, I would stand from a distance watching the stand. I gotta tell you guys, there were about three models that I looked at to go, if I ever get on the other side of that table, I'm gonna act like that person, right? And one of them was Stan, because if any of you guys had the good fortune to be in his line or whatever else, he, he has figured out, and if you guys ever get there, I don't care if it's in comic books or some other field, you make the people who put money in your pockets feel as good about themselves as possible in, in that short period of time that we have with you. A lot, I gotta tell you, a lot of celebrities don't understand that concept, so I'd like to applaud you for being so gracious to the fans for, for decades and decades and decades. Old kid just sit by his side all day long and pepper him with questions. I mean, that's what he did for me. And he would have done the same for you if you'd been in the exact same spot. So, hey, let's talk about your cameos. Uh, all the ones that you've Hold done. It. Cameos. Starring roles. Those happen to be roles in a movie which are condensed because the stars of the movies are jealous and don't want me to have too much time. <laughs> Academy Award Best Supporting Supporting Actor. 
right? A new category. Right? A new category. So now let me tell you why those cameos are so important. Everybody says, why do they give Mr. No Talent all those cameos? Here's the reason. Somebody goes to the movies to see a Marvel movie. Let's take the, the new X-Men movie. You go there, you sit through the whole movie, and suddenly you say, I didn't see Stan's cameo. Because I didn't do one. I was out of town when they did it, but that's not important. So they say, I didn't see Stan's cameo. Well, nobody is going to miss my cameo. They figure maybe I blinked my eye or I reached down for some popcorn. I missed it. So what do they do? They go to the box office. They buy another ticket. <laughs> they don't want to miss it. So half of the money that Marvel makes from those movies is because of my cameos. <laughs> What's your, what's your next starring role? My next starring role will be in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> I have to tell you, tell you, don't you do that. And I did it, I can't tell you what it is, but I have absolutely no idea what that cameo has to do with the movie. <laughs> You see, I never know what it'll be. The director calls me and says, we want to shoot your cameo. Can you come in on us at such a date and time? And I go, and I go to the wardrobe, and I go to makeup. If you can imagine any makeup improving me. <laughs> and then I, I shoot the scene, and I say goodbye to everybody and go home. I don't know the damn thing about the movie, but I know about my scene. And I don't know what my scene has to do with the Guardians of the Galaxy, so I'll be as eager as you to find out. Now, if that doesn't bring you into the theater, then I'm a lousy salesman. Plus, I heard the cameo on it is twice as long as most of your others, so it'll be four seconds, right? So. All right. It looks, is, is this our lineup of, of questions here? Wait a minute, you're going to have to do me a favor. Yes. Again, even though I look so wonderful, he, he kind of I don't hear as well as I used to. I probably won't understand the question. Would you repeat it to me, but not through the mic? Because when you're talking into the mic, I don't understand what you're saying because it muffles your voice for me, for my particular type. All right, so I will seductively reword it into your ear. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. they say. The other time, I'll take a look. All right, all right. So, okay, so where are we going to start the question, Jen? Up over here? He All loves right. the feeling of power of pointing we'll, we'll, to people. We'll get the questions, I'll bring it back to Stan. Yes, sir. So, um, my question is for Stan. Yes, it's for you, Stan. Leave me out. Like him. Oh, I forgot to Yeah. Um, I like your cameos, and I wanted to know which one is your favorite. Which cameo is my favorite? Yes. Don't think I was lying here just because I heard that. That man speaks very clearly. <laughs> I think the one I, I did in Captain America recently where I say I'm so fired because that was real acting because everybody knows I would never do anything to get myself fired. I'm very talented. Thank you. All right, we're going back and forth. All right, drop over this side. Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite school subject? My favorite what? Subject. Gee, really, none of them. I hate it. Actually, it was, it was composition. I like to write composition. Nobody ever read them, but I wrote them. And that was it. I, I was no good at, at mathematics. History, I have no memory. I couldn't remember. Even 1492, it took me about 10 years to remember when Columbus discovered America. And the name of his three ships, I still don't know. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't good at most things. But then we sang songs. Every week they had a glee club in the school. And they had what they called the listener's row. If you couldn't carry a tune, you had to sit in the listener's row and you had to keep your mouth shut. I was in the listener's role for all the time I was in school. If I even opened my mouth to sing a note, I would throw the whole class off, off key. 
I remember that, so that was not my favorite. I didn't have any favorite subjects, I don't think. I hated school. I shouldn't say that to all you young people. You young people there, I loved school. I spent all my time studying and learning. And, and I was going to say Googling, but they didn't have that. Oh, you are so lucky they have Google. You don't have to read books. You don't have to study. You just Google it. There it is. So when you still die, Stan when I was younger again uh, talk and he said he doesn't remember things right I, and I, I don't know if this is true but I remember you saying it on stage one day it's the reason why there's so many characters that have the same first name and oh, last yeah. name with the same initials right Sue Storm Reed Richard right Bruce Banner the reason was you if I remembered one name I knew the other name began with the same initials so it made it easy <laughs> I don't have a good memory. Who the hell is this? Right. <laughs> right. But, but to, to complicate it more, why was his name Robert Bruce Banner? Because he forgot, and he, he forgot he gave him two names, so he just added both the names to, and became Robert Bruce Banner, right? You're right. I remember getting fan mail from readers later. Don't you know the names of your own characters? <laughs> I didn't know quite how to respond. <laughs> All right, back over here. Hello, first of all, you look marvelous today. Aww. I'm sorry, I heard the word marvelous. She's, that? she's marvelous. She said you're a stud boy. Oh, I admire your, you're a great judge of character. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. My question is, we all think that you're superheroes and that you are our superhero. Who was like your role model and your superhero when you were growing up? Your, your voice is beautiful, but it's on a high pitch that I can't, can't get that pitch. Who Take was your role model? Just tell me. Oh. Every writer who wrote a book that I enjoyed. I loved reading books. And anything by um, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Or who wrote Sherlock Holmes? And forgot that that me with my memory. And the guy who wrote about the 20,000 leagues under the sea. I don't remember their names, but all these science fiction writers, and I loved Charles Dickens. I even loved Shakespeare. I couldn't understand really what most of Shakespeare was about when I was a kid, but I loved all that what ho Horatio kind of dialogue. You know? <laughs> and I loved reading, and all, every author, Mark Twain, uh, all of them. The guy who wrote The Raven with three names, what's his name? <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe, did I mention him? And I, I would read these guys and I'd say, how can they do it? Do you remember Edgar Allan Poe's poem? Uh, Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of monody, the melody but tell. Where did he get a word like monody? Who knows a word like that? And it goes on and on. These guys were geniuses. I think that's what I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a genius, but I only turned out to be a writer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Question over here. We're over here in this corner. Mark Twain was another one. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Leo. I want to say thank you for coming to Phoenix Comic Con, Stan. Uh, You're welcome. I missed you the last time you were in town, and that made me sad. <laughs> But now I'm glad. So, yeah, I am too. So my question. I'm anywhere. So my question is: uh, There's been many directors that have taken on the Marvel movies, including Brian Singer, Sam Raimi, and others. Is there a? Uh, <laughs> out loud! I was with them all day yesterday. What did I do wrong? To be You should have heard when I came home from Christ and sleep. They were having such a good time listening to Todd. Hey, now they'll have a good time with you. I'm going to sit down and rest for one. I'm thinking we should have uh, our have this guy do a spawn. Now you and Todd talk for him. Do spawn. Yes. Spawn. Yes. 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 Are you going to do that, that toy, that room who's toy? Gonna, who's going to be in Dallas? 
Guardians of the Galaxy. Who do we know in that movie? Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah. You know, you mean the one that comes out uh, August 1st? Yes, sir. So who's going to go see Mr. Worker or Mr. Stan Lee in Guardians of the Galaxy? Did we ever get the, the did we ever get to answer your question? Uh no. What's your question? What's your question? What's your question for Stan is, is there a director alive today that you would like to see take on one of the, your Marvel creations that hasn't done so? And if so, what is that person's name and which Marvel creation? Thank you. That's like three questions, dude. <laughs> okay, can you let you know is there Well, Felitti would have been great, but he's dead. <laughs> no, we've been lucky. We've had the greatest directors. Some of them, when they came on, I didn't even know who they were. I didn't know their names, but they did such a great job. Marvel has been lucky as hell, because apparently most of the directors love our characters, and they want to do those movies. And as you can imagine, the more successful the movies get, the more the directors want to do them. So they have no problem getting directors. Why they haven't asked me to direct one, I'll never know. But that's another subject. <laughs> James Gunn's a good director. We just have, don't talk in the mind, Here's what it sounds like to me. We talk to the mind. I'm like, yeah, yeah, If he's angry, I don't want him just to be angry. I want him to be furious. And if he's in love, he's not just in love. He's captured by romance. In fact, wait a minute, I want to tell you something about McFarlane. I don't remember where it was, Tart, but you and I were on a platform somewhere, and I was mentioning you. He did a shot, or you were giving an example, I think. And it was something we both agreed on. If you draw Thor with a cape floating in... It, there was something we said, if you draw Thor with a hat... He wouldn't be like this. He'd be like this. <laughs> you understand, Todd understands that so perfectly. It's one of the few things he does understand. <laughs> you, whatever emotion you have, whatever action you have, you carry it to the extreme. So we used to, oh, I'm still talking. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant too. Um, 
I mean, it doesn't matter. You go ahead. Waste I, I, time I will, I will so. repeat what he what, what he's saying that he thinks he heard me say, although he has bad hair. That what, what, what the theory was is common books, for any of you guys out there or gals that want to draw, it's all melodrama. It's all Broadway. It's all Broadway, right? If you're on a stage, you don't act on Broadway so that you can sell whatever you're doing to the first five roles. You, you overact for the last role. Yes, it's a, for grandma that's got bad eyes. So what he's saying is if you get hit, you have to overact it. So the, the theory I said with Thor was that I could take Thor in the most mundane situation and make him look cool, and the way that worked was... Mundane means a very simple, dull situation for any <laughs> DC readers. <laughs> And, and it went like this. Thor would be standing there, his legs would be apart, you go to three-quarter, he's got the big cape, the cape is billowing in the back. Why? Because the wind's blowing. He's got his helmet on with the wings. The wings are twisted because, again, the wind's going. He's got that cool hair that's going back, kind of Fabio-esque, and it's cutting across his face, and he's holding that hammer down here in a clutch. See all the veins in his arm? Lightning bolts are coming off the, the thing off off the hammer and the dust is kicking up from all that energy and the balloon says pass the salt <laughs> but darn it that's the best pass the salt panel you're ever gonna see it. it's really it's really what comic books are about just overselling so anyway. Back to the platform with someone that someone is not supposed to be cleverer or more interesting than I am. I want you to forget everything you heard for the past two or three minutes. <laughs> Jesus, McFarlane. All right, we got another question. Here. So, I got Mr. McFarlane. How, how do you suppose that relates to uh, uh, comic book characters coming to life on the film? You've been sitting there for five minutes. That's all you can come up with. <laughs> But you know we can't do that. No, no, you you can't I, you can't do it. But if I, can, it if I was directing, here's what here's, here's what I would say. I would go look at the one thing that we can get away with artistically is we can do silhouettes, and our silhouettes can be different. You know who the king is, right? Superman's the king, right? I hope you're following Hulk, every word of this. The Hulk is a brute, right? And spider man sort of this this little pedestrian guy that sort of does the cool stuff. So for you. If, if you were going to be, let's say, Venom, then the moments that you show me anger and rage, then I need Venom, you. Venom, 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 Venom. I co-created him. He's cool. So, <laughs> if you're going to be Venom, then at the moment that you get angry, then sell the anger, right? Because I don't want, what I don't want you to do is come in and go, I'm going to be giving my lines here, and now when you get angry, I want you to make my kids jump out of their seat and scare the crap out of them when you're delivering those lines at the key moments, not all the time. I don't want you to scare this little kid right here all the time. I want you at that moment to just go, what's your name? What's your name? Brienne. I want you to get it to Brienne. I want you to be a good fan. I want you to be there. And then I want you to go, and I want you to jump. I want to go, ow, that. You just made her jump? I need you to give me a couple of those during the movie. And I'll go, those are, those are really cheap jump scares. I have no idea what the man is talking about. <laughs> OK. I, what? What's your question, baby? Uh, if I was a superhero, um, a character, would you make me a superhero or a villain? Well, I would have to get to know her a lot better. <laughs> But I think we'll all agree that the supervillain is the most interesting one. So if you're an interesting person, and you must be to have asked a fascinating question like that, I think I would make you a supervillain. And I want anybody, anybody sitting near her to change your seat and move a little further away. We don't know how dangerous she may be. You know, Dr. Doom is supposed to be a supervillain, but I want you to think about it. All he wants to do is rule the world. Now, 
that's not a crime. You can walk up to a policeman and you can say, Officer, I want to rule the world. I can't arrest you. Anybody can want to rule the world. So Dr. Doom, to me, is not a villain. And you stop calling appointment quality. You know? Yeah, man. Dude, I didn't create him. You did. You forgot that part. That's on you, bud. That's on you. I gotta head? go. Yeah, I'm gonna go now. Tell me. I, it's a hot seat, man. I, 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 drink, I can feel the pressure. All right, Michael Worker, everybody. Give him a round of But you are my, you're my interpreter now over there. <laughs> you're in trouble now. You know, we work together on two movies now. You and I. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, see, well, and maybe. I, I don't know. Do you have a thing in Guardians of the Galaxy? A, a cameo. You do? I'm a, support, a small supporting role. Actually, I know. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to say that. Is it true? Yes, but you didn't know about my cameo? No, I've seen it. Well, where did you see it? I, I, I saw it on, on screen. You were in New York. What made you suddenly decide he's leaving? Why did you suddenly decide that? Oh, I just uh, suddenly decided. It was because you were talking so much. Yeah, you know, he, 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 you, know he, you know how he is. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you later backstage. We'll talk about him. Later, I'll get okay. Bye, guys. coming from? Right here, right here. Yes. Oh, look at that. Are you Venom or are you the black costume spider? Venom. Yeah. <laughs> what you from, young man? Um, what inspired you to making all these um comic book characters? Oh, it's a simple answer. Greed. <laughs> What did it keep working so I could pay the rent? And my publisher kept saying, hey, that one is selling well, now dream up another. And if I hadn't dreamed up another, he might have hired somebody else to dream up the other, so it was my job. I was the editor and the, and the writer at the Marvel Things in the beginning, and I just kept doing it. I never thought that someday I'd be addressing an audience like this, or that Marvel would become so big, it was a job. I didn't want to get fired, and that's all it was. And it turned out to be something very nice, and I thank you all for that, because if you hadn't bought the books, I wouldn't be sitting here, I'd be working somewhere. So thank you. I just wanted to ask Stan if you've ever had a story that you would love to tell, uh, but didn't think that it would work out quite well. If I had a story I'd love to tell, I didn't hear the rest. Never. Everything I wrote, I loved. <laughs> no, seriously, I... If I didn't like it, I wouldn't write it. Everything that I wrote was something that I wanted to say, and if I couldn't think of anything to say, I didn't write it. So, maybe I'm the only author like that, but I love everything I wrote. I am my biggest fan. That's what I'm <laughs> Over here now or no? Yeah, back over here. Oh, back over here. Okay, oh, Wolfie, what do you got? Look at It gives him a feeling of power to be the one to point yeah, to. Yeah, right down to you. Yes, sir, what would you like? Well, ask the man. Stand the man. Right? I'm taught the God. You remember that. He wants to know, uh, of all the characters you've written, what would you have a favorite amongst any of them? Is there a favorite child? You said he was cute. I hope he's like under seven years old. <laughs> and my favorite. I guess if I have to have a favorite, and I really don't, because they're all like my children, but if I had to have a favorite, it would have to be Spider-Man, I think. <laughs> I mean, somehow or other, he has become like Mickey Mouse. 
He's all over the world. He's big in China. He's big in Europe. He's big all over. Everybody recognizes him. So um, I'd have to be kind of fond of him, I guess. But is, there, is there any uh, character traits? Why, why him? Why him? I just told you why him. <laughs> Big in a lot of other countries. But point two, I mean, he's become like Mickey Mouse all over the world. People know him and love him. So how can I not love him? And besides, he's more like me than anybody. All right, we got. Uh, they're telling me we've got three more questions, and then. And then and you know, there's only three more. What? Something from up there came down and whispered that to you? No, because you were engaging these good people. I didn't engage you. I don't know what the hell you even got up here. We got, we got three more questions. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I was wondering how many characters, if any, have a real life basis on people you've known throughout your life. Oh, I'm sure. I don't think any writer writes any character without subconsciously thinking of people or movie stars or somebody who has those characteristics. But I, I don't do... There was only one. There was only one character I wrote where I was really thinking of a person when I wrote him. And that was Tony Stark, whom you may know as Iron Man. I was thinking of a new guy, I have no memory. Who's the guy who made the plane that never flew? Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. I was thinking of Howard Hughes. He was an adventurer, an inventor, a millionaire. In those days, being a millionaire was like being a billionaire today. And he was a genius, but he was also a little bit nuts. Well, we haven't made Iron Man nuts yet, but I thought it would be fun to take a character like Howard Hughes, who the readers should have liked, because he, he made armaments, and he was part of the military-industrial complex, and in those days, the teenagers hated those kind of people, and I thought it would be a challenge, a fun challenge, to take a character like that and see if I could make him popular. So that's the one character that I wrote that I really was thinking of a person. Everybody else, just fiction. Thank you. All right, thank you. What are the next question? Are you here? Are you Two more. Okay. okay, um, so like my question is, is what's it like what's the day in the life of Stan Lee? You know, like how does it feel like you can't go to the grocery store without people like, you know, like a day in the yeah. life? What is that? Yeah. Um, well, I will admit, people now do recognize me. <laughs> when I go to the airport and they're searching, you know, I, you got to put your arms out and they pat you down. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Lee, they say. So, and people stop me in this. It's funny. People used to stop you in the street if you were famous and ask for an autograph. Now they ask for an autograph and they say, can I take a picture of you? Because everybody has a little uh, phone with a camera in it. So a lot of people do that in the street, and uh, I gotta admit, I, I, I love it. <laughs> I don't get offended, I don't get angry. In fact, sometimes I pass somebody who doesn't say, hey, aren't you Stan Lee? I get a little offended. <laughs> Didn't you recognize me? Where have you been? <laughs> All right, last question here. Yes, sir. Um, what was your inspiration or like creation idea for a uh, Spider-Man? Because that was my childhood hero, and I thank you for that standing. Oh boy, it's a long story. How much time do we have? Yeah, this is a good one, but we got all day. You're so all right. <laughs> that's not that good. Because I talk a lot. I had just done whatever heroes I had done, maybe the X-Men and Fantastic Four, I forget which, and my publisher, who was a strange guy, but I won't discuss that now, but he said to me, hey Stan, I think we're on a roll. We have a couple of good selling heroes. Come up with another one for me. So I wanted to keep my job. So I went home and started thinking, and I saw a fly crawling on the wall. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to have a hero 
who could stick to the wall like it. No, I'm not telling the truth. In those days, they probably didn't have the word cool. I probably said, wouldn't it be groovy? But it was the same thing, to have a character crawl on the wall. So I thought, sort of like an insect. And then I thought, okay, now I need a name. To me, names are very important. Like the Hulk. I mean, you had to love a guy called the Hulk. Anyway, I thought, what do I call the guy? Insect man? Nah, it didn't sound dramatic. Mosquito man? Nah. And I went down the list and I got the Spider Man. Spider Man. I said, wow, I've got my name. Then I decided to make him different. I'd make him a teenager. And finally, I thought to make the, the readers empathize with him, I give him a lot of personal problems. He'd be poor, he'd live with an aunt who's always sick and stuff like that. So I went to my publisher the next day and I was so excited. I told him my idea. And he said, Stan, that is the worst idea I've ever heard. He said, first of all, people hate spiders, so you can't call a hero Spider-Man. You want him to be a, 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 a teenage hero? Don't you understand teenagers can only be sidekicks? And then he said, and you want him to have personal problems? Don't you know anything about superheroes? They don't have personal problems. They're superheroes. So I walked out of the office with my tail between my legs, but I couldn't get the idea out of my mind. So we were going to kill a magazine. I think it was called Amazing Fantasy. Now, when you kill a magazine, nobody cares what you put in the last issue, because you're killing it. So I thought I'd get Spider-Man out of my system. I'd put him in that magazine. And Steve did go through him. I, I gave it to Jack Kirby first, but he made him look too heroic. I said, I wanted to be just an ordinary, klutzy kind of teenager. Gave it to Steve Ditko, who drew klutzy characters. And we featured him on the cover, and I forgot about it. About a month later, after the sales figures came in, my publisher came running into my office, and he said, hey, Stan, do you remember that Spider-Man character of yours that we both liked so much? <laughs> He said, let's make a series of it, and that's how Spider-Man was born. Uh, just so you guys know, Stan Lee is the only person in the comic book community that has his own star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He's the only one who ever done that. And they run lousy stars. Yeah, but that's why that's a big deal. Because all this stuff that I grew up with, that people kept saying you're a geek, you're a nerd, you have to hide it away from people. We're going mainstream, right? We've, we've now taken over the meek, have now inherited the earth. I say the geek have now inherited the earth. Right?